As we're defining each of the operators, we talked a little bit about the material conditional, and uh, I promised that I'd say something about you know, why uh, philosophers in the early 20th century had some philosophical objections to the material conditional, and uh, this led them to think a little bit about the status of these operators and the way we define them, etc. So um, let's review what we what we mean by the material conditional. So um, whoops. So let's look at our truth table here. So we'll recall that the conditional if p then q is false only in the second case in case p is true and q is false and true in all other cases. So what you're saying then is that if you assert if p then q you're basically asserting the negation of the second case. Okay so if you say um, if p then q you're basically saying not the second case. Whoops. Not the second case. So it's going to be not this one. Okay, so denying the second case on the truth table is what, what uh, we're doing when we're asserting that if p then q. Saying if p then q is the same as denying that p and not q. Um, okay, so the material conditional then can be true even when the antecedent is completely irrelevant to the consequent. This is also puzzling, right? So why would it be that the um, antecedent has no sort of connection to the to the consequent, and yet the conditional is true? So. If we look at uh, if, b, then, q, this is actually handy because we're thinking a little bit about the truth table as we do this. We can see that if, b, then, q is also equivalent to not p or q. Now, how did we get that? Well, look at this. What are we saying? We're saying q is true here and q is true here. These are the cases where it's true. In these cases, it's true. And if not p, then in the in cases 3 and 4, where it's not the case that p, then we know it's true. So when is p then q true? p then q is true in case 1, 3, and 4. So case 1, 3, or 4. In 3 and 4, we've got not p. And in case 1, we've got q and p. But just saying not p or q is enough to express if p then q. Now if you're if you're concerned about that it might be useful to run the truth table here. So if we run the truth table for not the case that p or q how would we do that? Well, what we do is we lay out the truth, our conventional truth, truth values for p and q. So, falling here would be t t f f. Falling under q would be t f t f. The negation of t t f f is f f t t. And then what we do is we join the two together here um, with the disjunction. So you'd have f f t 
T, T, and then T, F, T, F. Lo and behold, join them together with the OR, you'd have true. Why? Because the disjunction is true when one of the disjuncts is true. It's false in all other cases, so that this case would be false. True. True. Okay, so lo and behold, TFDT is the truth value for this whole piece here. This whole <coughs> and that is equivalent to the truth value for the conditional. TF, T, T. So they're the same. Okay, so there seems to be something a little bit unpleasant here because we want to think that the conditional has some additional kind of oomph to it, that it's not just restating not P or Q. There's got to be something different from saying, let's say you say, you know, if I run a marathon, then I'll be tired. Surely that can't be captured by it's not the case that I ran a marathon or I'm tired. But that is what the material conditional says. So the material conditional just seems to be unintuitive. So if we say, for example, um, we've, we've seen that it's equivalent to a case like, uh, so if P then Q is equivalent to, you know, not P or Q, it's also equivalent to the denial of the second case, so it's equivalent to the denial of, so the negation of P and not Q. Um, so there, there's something, something really horrible about that, because there seems to be more to the conditional, as we've seen. Okay, likewise, it looks like all the false cases, right? Look have a look over here. So in the false cases, false cases all come out making the conditional as a whole true, right? So in cases where the antecedent is false, the conditional comes out true. So puzzlingly, if you have a contradiction, then what you're going to say is no matter what's the consequent of a conditional that has a contradiction for its antecedent. So no matter what consequent a contradiction has as its um, or a, 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 so no matter what so no matter what the consequent is of a conditional that has a contradiction as its antecedent, that conditional is true. That's a bit of a mouthful, but basically what we're saying is that if we if we take this view of material conditionals, then contradictions imply anything. So this would be this would be a really odd conclusion. And uh, you'd really want to avoid contradictions if that was the case because from a contradiction anything follows if this is if this is true so why is it then that a contradiction implies any sentence well we look back and we'd say okay well look if you look at the two false cases they come out true just by the definition of the conditional all right so it's kind of a horrible situation Back in the early 20th century, C.I. Lewis, in his um, book, Survey of Symbolic Logic from 1918, noticed this, and he argued that we should have a different kind of uh, logical operator, and it's one that doesn't fall neatly within our, our um, account so far. He called it strict implication. And strict implication, then, is an attempt to include some real or strong notion of necessity into the implication statement. 
So logically, logical necessity then gets um, construed as a kind of purely formal kind of necessity, just a matter of the way we happen to organize our formal systems. And there is something true to that. Um, what Lewis wanted was, was some way of grasping real necessity. And he thought of this real necessity as a property of the real world, not just a property of our formal representation. Um, and he thought that the failure to capture our ordinary sense of, you know, how conditionals work indicated that there was some need to introduce another kind of conditional, another kind of implication, and he called that strict implication. All right, so um, material implication versus strict implication, what's going on here? Well, notice that the key difference is the introduction of this um, diamond right here. And the diamond makes the difference. The diamond is sort of the, the it's a symbol representing possibility. So let's look over here in um, the way we're looking at things. If P then Q ends up being equivalent to not the case that P and not Q or not P or Q. Over here, strict implication is a little bit different. He used a different symbol, but more importantly, he was trying to capture this notion of not possible. So the additional piece of apparatus here, the additional concept is here. It's, he's saying it's not possible that P and not Q. So if we say that if I run a marathon, then I'll be tired. What he's saying is, with strict implication, if that strictly, if P strictly implies Q, then it's not possible that I could run a marathon and not be tired. So he really wanted to capture that additional um, concept of necessity, and he set the foundation then for, for what we now call modal logic. Modal logic is the study of the logical behavior of concepts like necessity and possibility. Um, modal logic gives rise to epistemic logic and deontic logic, etc. So, but we'll, that's beyond the scope of our discussion here. Okay. In this course, we're going to be restricting our attention to an extensional construal of logic. So we're, extensional logic concerns the terms only according to the concrete entities to which they refer, whereas intentional um, construals of the semantics of logic concern the meaning, you know, the meanings, how, how, how definitions relate to one another or relationships between the definitions. So for example, if I wanted an extensional um, account of a word like human being, the extensional value would be the set of all human beings, I suppose all past, present, and future human beings. Um, whereas the intentional definition or intentional uh, characterization of um, a term like human being would be something like the meaning of the definition of what it is to be human. So let's say it's featherless, two-legged animal, um, or rational animal, or something something along those lines, proposed definitions of, of, um, of human being. Then the intentional definition would be concerned with the relationship between the meanings of terms and not, whereas the extensional definition has to do with the set of objects to which the term truly applies. We're going to be focused on the extensional. Modal logicians and others introduce um, intentional considerations. Again, they're beyond the scope of this course, but you can see that, the, that all of this is motivated, and sort of the birth of modal logic was motivated by worries about the character of the material conditional. Okay, so that was slightly off topic, but uh, it's important to know, especially if you want to continue in philosophy.